Absolutely, a long time coming, but it's like coming home. It is home, it's your house. Of course. <laughs> You're keen to promote the overseas territories. Gibraltar is your first visit to one. It is indeed, and very important. Where else could I start but Gibraltar? And of course, my, my big issue was, what am I going to do as speaker? What, what, you know, what, what am I going to be? What am I about? And straight away, of course, my closeness to the overseas territories, my history supporting the OTs, and none more so than Gibraltar. So what I wanted to do was put them at the forefront of our parliament in the UK. It's in the end, as we know, that when UK vote, it affects people in overseas territories. And that's why I wanted to build a better relationship, true respect for the OTs. And when they see the flag of Gibraltar flying over parliament, I think that's just, personally, I just like have a tear in my eye when I say and say, yes, the OTs have made it to Parliament. And in a sneakier way, perhaps nice to see the Royal Gibraltar Regiment tie in Parliament. Oh, uh, of course, I, I do get messages. <laughs> He's wearing his tie. In fact, I've been accused of not wearing it today. And I said, well, you know, to wear it in London, I think, is where we send a very clear message. Of course, I didn't bring any of my regimental ties. I thought, no, my wife said, no, stop wearing the same ties. I get told off, so I've got to be careful. But yeah. No, it uh, is part of my clear message. Let me wear the tie wherever possible. Talking of regiments, one of your passions is the Royal Navy, the Armed Forces. Uh, a good weekend to be here. There's a, a lot of ships that you can see from your bedroom window. Another link to the Rock, the Armed Forces. Very, very much so. The Armed Forces matter. Still plays a major part of being part of Gibraltar. And the fact 6% of the economy comes from the MOD being based here. And of course, it, it, it is that front-loading of, of the MOD being based here, the historic nature of what the rock's about. It was this military garrison. And, of course, the fact that Gibraltar is back in trend with the armed forces. As we could see that today, you know, I've been on many occasions where you didn't see a Navy ship. And today, four, five ships, who knows how many coming back to Gibraltar. And I think that's the real difference, isn't it? So not only are we seeing a real commitment again from the MOD, the fact that this is one of our forward staging bases and loading, loading, going out, and operations, and I was in yesterday, an A400M was on the runway, and it's that forwarding onwards to Mali and places like that. So Gibraltar is very in vogue again, and that's good news. And I'm pleased about that, because that's part of this great relationship. And the fact that the Gibraltar Regiment is part of the United Kingdom, that met the RAF on the runway and operate it, you know, where else in the world would you find somewhere as unique as Gibraltar? The, the RAF base is also the base for all the carriers coming in, British Airways, you know, they're all landing here. And I'm the same with the Navy being here. I think, you know, it's a very clear message and I'm pleased to see a real commitment from the UK government through the MOD as well. For those few who don't know you, you've been brought up on a diet of Gibraltar. <laughs> well, and it's not been a bad diet. I've, <laughs> I've got to say, it's, it's always a great diet. I think none better when I come, you know. To literally get off that plane yesterday, you leave a dull London to turn up in sunshine, you know, and, and then you see, I've just, I've just left a, a London policeman with his helmet on to get off a plane to see a policeman with a helmet on, you know. And I, th I think it's about that unique relationship, that part of the United Kingdom in the sun. And, and of course, you know, that's what matters to me. And all that history we've had in the past, you know, whether we're going to have two flags, you know, where I went through all that pain, uh, fighting my own government, to standing up for the rights of Gibraltar, matters so much to me. And that's why... You know, with my job, it's a, it's a different. It's it's. I'm not the politician in that sense. I don't do all the heavy political lift. But what I have got is the ability to use soft power, influence behind the scenes, talking to the foreign secretary, talking to the prime minister, discussing what matters. The same with the leader of the Labour Party. I have all these meetings with all the different politicians. So I'm still there, but just doing it in a different way. Talking of the politicians and your role as Speaker, what's it like to be Speaker now in these strange times with strange people? <laughs> <laughs> is that, and that's just me. <laughs> well, it, it is strange times and, and, and it's a different Parliament. And what I would say is 
Every, we're all different, aren't we? So I'm the 158th speaker in the House of Commons. 750 years of history. I'm the 158th. The one thing I would say is every speaker has been different, different in their approach and different ways of doing things. So none of us are the same. In the same way, a new, a new election comes, there's a whole new set of people coming in there, there's a whole new government comes along, ministers turn over, MPs change. So it's always evolving in the UK. Different issues. Different issues, different problems and different difficulties ahead. <laughs> what support do you feel there is for Gibraltar in the British Parliament? What, what, what I would say is, it's strange, isn't it? Because when I went through all this, as I said, uh, on, under a Labour government with Tony Blair, trying to get new access into Europe using Spain and Italy as his access, um, and Gibraltar becoming a pawn in that, um, I would say we, we were very high profile. We were very much a nuisance. We were putting questions down every day, written questions, oral questions. We were asking, asking for debates. We were putting for debates all the time. So we made it a very high-profile issue because of the political nature of the ones that were in the Gibraltar group. What it says, you know, some might say that was the right thing to do at that time. Of course, the Gibraltar group now has got different members running it. The fact is they do it in a different way. And, you know, who's to judge? Should it be high profile or should it be done, you know, behind the scenes rather than at the forefront of putting the government on the spot? What I would say is I genuinely believe that people within Parliament have this great respect for Gibraltar and recognise that people need support within Parliament. Um, I also say that when you have a huge turnover of MPs, it's much harder because we've got to re-educate them who might not have had an interest or understand Gibraltar. So it's that educational process that's got to be ongoing. So, in a sense, when you get a big swing and a big change in Parliament, it's not good for Gibraltar because we've got to start the process all over again to get people involved, to back them, to support them, and, and no more so than the opposition. We've got to lift their understanding of Gibraltar as Interesting well. Interesting that you should have said that. Have you noticed that with the, perhaps, I don't want to use the word removal, of the old guard because of Brexit, have you noticed that there has been another, a different wave? Well, what I would say is the, the, the old guard moves on and some are still around. But you've still got some great advocates. You know, you, you, you've got Bob Neill, who's, who's chairing the group, and that's so important because Bob's influential within government, he's highly respected, and he's a good voice for Gibraltar. And that's important. So I know you've got good people, I know you've got great advocates, and, of course, they're there. And I'm always there as well. You've had a lot of meetings today. You've met a lot of people. They must have been, you must have had your head done in about the treaty. So tell me, talk to me about that treaty. What support do you think there is for it in the British Parliament? What, what, what I would say is, and, and I've got to be very careful because I've got to uh, be, be non-political, so I want to stand back but give my overview for what it's worth. I will always say there is always a voice for Gibraltar. There is always people raised to support Gibraltar's needs. And as I say, it's a difficult time. Brexit was something that Gibraltar didn't vote for, but the United Kingdom did. Part of that goes responsibility. And I generally say there is a responsibility by the United Kingdom to look after Gibraltar and to support Gibraltar in the same way of Northern Ireland. Those issues aren't million miles apart, for, for, far from it. They're the two issues that need to be resolved quickly for the benefit of both Northern Ireland and Gibraltar. And what I would say is there are people who speak behind the scenes, they speak in Parliament and they raise the issue. And that really does matter. And I've got to say, the Chief Minister, as we know, is in Brussels, he's due to come back. It's that continuous dialogue that's got to go ahead. But there has to be an end to that. And the end has to be for the benefit of Gibraltar as well. And what I would say is, if it, if it goes sour, then the responsibility lies on the United Kingdom to look after the people of Gibraltar. What we cannot do is leave you abandoned and isolated. So what I would say is, I believe the government is there and doing what it's doing, and it must continue to do so on your behalf. It's got to be a voice. From my point of view, I watch this, but what I can assure you is, I will always speak and speak to people, try and ensure that... The future is going to be good for all of the United Kingdom, for all of the overseas territories. So it's much greater. And recognising the need of Gibraltar, I would say that those advocates will always be there for you.
So you're not here as speaker, you're here because you've been installed as Chancellor of the University of Gibraltar. What does that mean to you? It's really exciting, isn't it? It's an absolute privilege to be, you know, asked to become Chancellor of the University. Not just any old university, but the University of Gibraltar. What more could I ask for? You know, my father might have freedom of Gibraltar, <laughs> but I'm now the Chancellor of the University. So I've got to say, it, it, it's a huge honour, it's a huge privilege, and I've got to say, it's a great reason to come to Gibraltar.